Hello and welcome to iNerdius and the Science Fiction Randomly playlist. Today I am going to talk about Podcane of Mars by Robert Heinlein. So this is the 1966 printing of the 1963 edition. This version of the book contains the ending that it was originally published with, which was not the ending that Heinlein wanted. I've read the other ending as well, but I knew even when I originally read this back in the 70s that this was really not the ending that Heinlein wanted, and everyone knew what really happens at the end of this. So with that said, I thought it would be interesting to talk about Podcane of Mars, and especially this edition, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is the weird marketing speak that is used on this book. For example, here on the front cover, the fantabulous secret weapon in the Cold War between the worlds. Um, kind of weird, kind of a weird thing to talk about. You don't really get the impression that there's a an actual Cold War happening. I mean, there are politics going on, and there is and aggressive politics at that, assassination attempts, not really a Cold War. People can travel between the planets, Mars, Earth, and Venus being the three major planets in the solar system where people live. And the main character and her uncle and her younger brother are from Mars, obviously, and they are traveling to Earth, but first they are stopping over in Venus. But the way this is marketed is really crazy. So on the back, you can see <laughs> tomorrow's answer to the anti-missile missile podcane of Mars, an interplanetary bombshell who rocked the constellations when she invaded the Venus Hilton and attacked the mighty mechanical man with a strange overpowering blast of highly explosive sex appeal, which, uh, well, I'll, I'll have something to say about that shortly. But then this next, <laughs> this next bit, I don't, I don't even know what it's supposed to say. A centrifugal tale of two planets by the mastermind of science fiction Robert Heinlein. Are they trying to make a play on the word centrifugal? Perhaps. I don't really get that, but that's a very bizarre, <laughs> a bizarre way to market this. And then in the front cover. <laughs> a heavenly body. She was the sun, the moon, and the stars. Wherever pretty potty rocketed, her radiation waves could be felt for light years. The fun and games rooms at Las Vega, Venus, had never seen anything like this minx from Mars. Potty was having the time of her celestial life until one of her male satellites discovered that Podcane spelled trouble in anybody's orbit. So, literally, that has nothing to do with the story. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, really bizarre, really bizarre. Attack the Mighty Mechanical Man? What is that? Uh, that doesn't even exist in this book. So, I don't know. It's very weird marketing. I don't know. Obviously, they are trying to sell this as a book with a bombshell female protagonist with probably lots of, I don't know, sex in it or something. I mean, it's really crazy. Does Heinlein portray her as a girl with sex appeal? Yeah, I mean, she's 15 years old in this. She's a teenager. She's just discovering her interest, I guess, in sex. The marketing does not really do it justice. There are times when she is extremely, extremely self-aware of her or aware of her effect on the men of the crew of the ship that they take from Mars to Venus, and also of the men um, that she meets on Venus. Is she portrayed as attractive? Yeah, although she doesn't realize it until later on. She just thinks that it's because she has a female body that somehow that's all is required to attract all these men. There's a lot of attention paid to that and the way she thinks. Now, obviously, not being a 15-year-old girl, I don't know if that's the way girls actually think at that age, but 
apparently Heinlein did, or at least thought this girl thought that way. She does have a high IQ, so maybe she's more aware and more self-aware than most teenage girls are. I don't know. Um, it's got a lot of typical Heinlein gimmicks in it. There's the high IQ characters, especially the younger brother, Clark, who has an absurdly high IQ. Weirdly, it seems in Heinlein's world, when somebody has a high IQ, they have a low EQ, I guess. They lack emotions. So there's sort of a negative relationship going on there. The higher somebody's IQ is, the less they feel emotions. Um, that seems to be the case definitely in this book. In fact, at the very end, the character Clark, who is a little boy really in this, he's, I don't even think he's a teenager yet, um, says that he wishes he could cry. Like he's so smart that he can't even cry when his, well, I'm gonna give a spoiler away here, sorry, when his sister is killed. So that's a little bit much in my opinion. People with high IQs actually still feel emotions. There are a lot of the typical Heinlein idiot lectures about science, about how space travel works. There is a lot of politics talked about in here where the main character's uncle, Pod Kane's uncle, tells her all about what's going on politically in, in the situation that he's involved in, which is really the plot. Pod Kane is not really involved in the main plot of the story here. She's sort of a bystander who picks up information about what's going on here and there and is kind of doing her own thing until the very end when she actually becomes more or less a victim within the plot of the story. So that's a little bit weird, but I don't really mind that. I kind of like it when the main character is not necessarily the main person involved in the story, in the plot, I mean. She's the main person involved in the story, obviously, but not in the plot per se. So that I don't mind. I think that's actually can be very interesting. The only thing I, the, the, the biggest problem I had with this story was that we start off with Pod Kane determined to become a spaceship pilot, a captain of a spaceship someday. And you get the feeling that she's exactly the kind of person who could pull it off, who could do it. But this is written in the fifties and so the idea that women could be spaceship captains is still kind of far-fetched, apparently, according to Heinlein here, the way it's portrayed anyway. And she's made to believe that it is such a far-fetched idea that anybody would ever let a female become the captain of a spaceship that she very quickly changes her goal to be married to the captain of a spaceship and perhaps even be the pediatrician on board a spaceship. Very appropriate roles for a female to play in a 50s mindset when it comes to the workplace. And so that was a little bit disappointing. You kind of wanted this character to say, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to be a spaceship captain. I don't really care what anybody says. And you want her uncle to say, yeah, you go for it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. And Clark to say, well, it's going to be a hard road, but yeah, you could probably do it. You're smarter than most people. But that didn't happen here. It really frustrated me, actually, when that didn't happen, because you wanted it to happen. You wanted this character to go there. Um, so that was really kind of annoying. If I were turning this into a movie, I would actually change that. <laughs> um, and I think justifiably so. Anyway, the some of the other ideas... Oh, the, the, the brother character, as I mentioned before, he's a genius with 160 IQ. For comparison, Stephen Hawking had an IQ of 160. Einstein's was estimated to be 160. Podkane has an IQ of 140. So Heinlein is actually taking this idea of IQ, which was a big thing in psychology back then, and, and applied it to, you know, essentially his idea of what the competent man is. And in this case, the competent man is the uncle and the younger brother Clark, and Podkane, to a lesser extent, becomes the competent woman. But she is sidetracked by babies. She is roped into taking care of babies, decides she really likes it. It's Again, this is a gender appropriate role for her to be playing on the spaceship. And so the story takes advantage of that and actually does work it into the ending. This idea that she becomes infatuated with babies and that is what leads to her demise at the end, even if it is an alien baby that she tries to rescue, whereas she could have escaped easily like the Clark character who didn't give a flying fuck about the baby and took off. So 
you know, there's another sort of appropriate way for the female to act in a story like this. But aside from that, I did appreciate the way Heinlein approached politics in here. And this is going to be something I think that acts as a counterpoint to some of the charges that are leveled at him after somebody reads Starship Troopers. In this particular story, Podkane at one point rails against politicians. She just hates politicians. And her uncle, who is a politician, points out that, look, here's the deal with politicians. We need politicians to settle disputes. If we don't have politicians settling disputes, then the only other way to settle them is through fighting, through war, through force, the use of force. And so, yeah, politics may be a terrible way of getting things done, of making agreements and trying to avoid conflict, but it's better than the alternative, which again is warfare. And he makes a very eloquent argument and sets her straight in that regard, explaining why we need politics and why politicians matter. Of course, you know, there are good politicians and bad politicians, and bad politicians are the ones that take advantage of their position and lead the various parties involved in negotiations, for example, towards resolutions that may actually result in fighting. Overall, it's a fast read, like most of what Heinlein writes, at least especially his YA, uh, his juveniles, very, very fast read. There is a little bit of a slog in the middle, but generally speaking, this is a page turner like most of his books, in my opinion. Again, this would make, I think, a very interesting movie or miniseries, but with the main character perhaps given a little less of a gender-conforming role to play in what's going on in the story. And so we'll see if anybody ever decides to make it. I mean, there are lots of great books out there, lots of great short stories, lots of great novels that haven't been adapted into movies or TV shows yet. So, you know, this may be not that high on the list for a lot of people, but I think that for a female lead character with a good rewrite, um, this could actually be worth doing. So there you have it, Podcane of Mars by Robert Heinlein. Thank you very much.